We're not even out of week one and we already have a fraudulent upset. And I can't think of a better way to start this first ever football frenzy. So let's get after it. Welcome to the masses. It is the first football frenzy of the season. We have upsets. It is going to be a fantastic football season. And the Iceman and the coach are here with you every step of the way. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Football Frenzy. I am the Iceman, Matt Freights. And that, of course, virtually is the coach, Brad Powell. Coach, welcome to the frenzy. Iceman. Woo. I am. I'm, I'm so freaking jacked right now. Um, you know, that's that uh, scene in. Um, you ever seen the big short? You know, I have movie, the big so this short. is going to be a really terrible Seriously? segment. No, I have not. Okay. Well, for any of you, it's a great movie. It's worth your time for anyone who's seen the big short when they finally sort of realize they're going to cash in on, uh, shorting the housing market. Um, Ryan Gosling's character is like, goes into the bathroom to like, he's on the phone and he's like screaming in this like high pitched voice, but not too loud saying like, I'm jacked, I'm jacked to the tits. And that's how I feel. Um, I'll have to send you, like, I'm sure there's a clip of it on YouTube. Uh, that is how I feel going into week one of college football season. I, I think we are on the precipice of the most exciting college football season in history. And I, I'm not, that's not even hyperbole with the 12 team playoff um, on the horizon. It's incredibly exciting. And I apologize if I come across as like a giddy little kid in the show because this is so awesome. So awesome. You know, I think there are some people who maybe would take umbrage to you saying that, but I felt a lot better when Pat McAfee himself on game day said almost those exact words. And I think I texted you immediately. I was like, Pat just said, this is the most exciting college football season ever. He's and been watching, he, obviously. And that's exactly what I thought, obviously, he's been watching. Why wouldn't <laughs> he watch? He's one of four people watching right now. I would assume that he watches this to prep for every single Saturday. I mean, that would make a lot of sense. But I think you're right, though. And while I think this past week didn't necessarily translate to what we're talking about, and and that's why maybe it seems hyperbolic when we say this is the most exciting college football season that I think we can remember even entering, I think that over the course of the season, it's going to rear its head in that fashion because I just believe that there's just so much to look forward to with expanded playoff and these new conferences, all of these new matchups that we're going to see that are now things that we're going to see regularly. And maybe this year it will be the best because it is fresh, but it doesn't matter because we can't worry about 10 years from now. We can only worry about now. And this is exciting. It is. And I heard someone else mention this today and I'm like, you know what? I didn't even think about that. And that is the fact that we are in for maybe the perfect storm to have that historical season because there is not a single like elite team that just sticks above the rest going into the season. Now, there's a few that people think very highly of Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon. You know, you can name a few, but I don't think anyone thinks that those teams are 2019 LSU or, you know, some of the other historically great teams that we've seen that just seem like the odds on favorite wire to wire. So I think that sets up beautifully for the 12 team playoff because if we did have someone that was like head and shoulders, the favorite above everyone else, it would sort of negate the, the fun of the 12 team playoff, but we could certainly end up in a situation where at the end of November, we have 15 to 20 teams that believe that they have a realistic chance to compete for a national championship. And that is what I think is the most exciting thing about it. Now, do I think there are 15 to 20 teams that will be good enough to win a national championship? No, but are there, how many teams they let in the NFL playoffs now, like 14 or something? So weird. Yeah. It's like seven and seven. Yep. Are there 14 teams that you think could win the Super Bowl? No, probably not. But they still let 14 teams in the playoffs. So I, I, that's what I don't understand the whole argument about. It dilutes it. Blah, blah, blah. No, it's awesome. It, more football that means something is better for all of us. I totally agree with you. And before we get into the meat of what we're going to talk about, just want to remind everybody that we are live. It is Wednesday night. If you are watching in the United States, we're going to be replaying this on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. I know some of you will be watching College Game Day, but if you weren't able to catch it, that is the time. It's also going to be an audio as well. Just want to remind everybody at the top that 
it, you're going to have another opportunity to watch this if it was so good or if you just missed it, I guess. But let's talk about the playoff for a second because this is kind of a good segue into, I think, what was the most talked about result of this past weekend. And the 12-team playoff, you're 100% right, it does open the door for a lot more teams. And I think you and I, in the past, when this was first kind of talked about, probably even at the end of last year, talked about the fact that people are going to say the 13th team, the 14th team, they're all going to complain. And they did get into this on game day. And I could think of no better person to hypocritically do this than Nick Saban, who really didn't have to worry about being the 13th or 14th team. But he did say that you're going to hear those arguments still. But I think the part of it that is baked in that isn't going to be talked about is I don't think that nationally speaking, many people are going to feel that the 13th team left out is going to be considered a real contender. Because even though, to your point, there is not some juggernaut that we're waiting for the national championship coronation with. I think that we both know that, generally speaking, only eight teams realistically have a shot at a national championship. Yeah, I mean, typically speaking, what what you're trying to say, I think, is that the 12-team playoff, for the most part, at least as it's currently structured, it takes away the argument of 12-0 UCF, right? Yes. Um, because under these circumstances, that team will get their chance. And that's all I think anybody wants is for those teams that maybe these FCS teams and UCF's not, you know, they're in a power conference now, but these FCS teams, not group of five teams that sit on the periphery sometimes when they have these great seasons, we're just asking for them to have a seat at the table. Yes. And now they have that, right? They have that chance. Um, I would agree that in most cases, that team that sort of rises um, unexpectedly doesn't have what it takes to win a national championship. And I'm not big in like participation trophies or they deserve it, but I'm going to say it. They at least deserve a crack at it and they're going to yeah. get it now. Yeah, the chance is what we've all been sort of talking about. And I think we understand that UCF probably wouldn't have won the national championship, but never getting a chance when you're undefeated. There's been other teams too, Coastal Carolina. We even talked about James Madison last year. So it's just a matter of, as you said, getting a seat at the table and they're gonna get that opportunity this year. And we're gonna get the opportunity to see just how all of this plays out. Because last week you talked about, we've never seen a team have to do this in a playoff atmosphere and they're going to have to do it this time. But there's a long season to get to until we even come close to talking about that. However, let's get to what I want to talk about. Now, if you paid any attention, this is called something like Fraud State Seminoles or something like that because, and I just want to be clear, I'm not necessarily a Florida State hater, but just like you feel, we spent the last eight months hearing from their fan base in, in various places about how they got left out of the playoff. And then during college game day, hearing them boo every time Kirk Herbstreet said anything. And to have all of that, to feel like you got robbed of something, and then also to come out and get blown out by Georgia, understanding that a lot of players opted out of the game, and then to lay this egg in the first game of the season, I'm with you that if you're going to complain this much, you should look a little bit better in week one. And I also realize that the two teams are remotely not even close. Oh, yeah. and one. Thank you. Uh, I love it, man. Uh, I agree. It's It was sort of the, and I get it, that last team compared to this year's team of Florida State, it's a completely different iteration, but you know who are the same, or what is the same, and that's the absurd fan base yes. and these crazy morons that have, have spent months and months complaining, booing Kirk Herbstreet all morning on college game day every time he spoke because the man just simply spoke the truth last year, which we the did majority too. of the country agreed with. Um, and I, I, perfect karma, the way that it worked out, you know, I, I think we're going to get into it here. Does this, is this more of an indictment on Florida state? Or is, is Georgia tech better than people giving them credit for so on and so forth. But first and foremost, this couldn't happen, could not have happened to a group of uh, a better group of people than the Florida state faithful. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I have a question. Are we going to get canceled because you just did the tomahawk chop on this? I mean, I feel like that's borderline these days. I don't know. That's, uh, I mean, what thousands, tens of thousands of people do it every Saturday. I'm sure. Um, and well, we're isolated Florida, now. So. We can't be a part of this large group that gets to do it in mass. <laughs> but th I, the thing about it is, as a fan, right? You and I are both fans, and we talk about how this show is Sports 101, and we talk about the the every fan and kind of having that perspective. 
And being a fan is about being a fanatic in a lot of ways, is that you have some undescribable or indescribable love for this team, whether they hurt you or whether they make you happy in winning, right? And so I, I'm okay with there being anger. I'm okay with there being some semblance of bitterness because your team didn't make the playoff. And from all accounts, they had a great season last year. They just got very unlucky that their star quarterback went down when he went down. And yes, they won games at the end of the season, but the committee's job was to find the four best teams. And the way that they were constructed at that time was not so. And it's okay to be bitter in that moment, but to carry it all the way until this season, when this team, to be fair to this Florida State team, was never going to live up to those expectations because it's a different team. You lost a lot of firepower. And they don't speak for the fans, but the fans do speak for them. And so because the fans were so obnoxious during game day, you and I were rooting for them to lose, and they did. And it stinks for the team, but to your point earlier about the playoff, they're still technically in it. And so that's also a good pro byproduct of this new system, is if you lose early, you still have a shot. Yeah, and you know, being in one of the power conferences, all you have to do is navigate your way to a conference championship and and you'll be in. And I think that they're still well well within um reach of that for sure. You know, we're that's just week zero, right? It's not even week one, it's week zero. They didn't look great. There's no denying that. And I I don't think that they are as bad as maybe as being made out to be. I think that there were a lot of people that thought very highly of Georgia Tech coming into the season and, and into that game. Budge, one of them. Yeah, I don't think there were there were a lot of people that were incredibly surprised by the by the outcome. Maybe them winning outright, but um, I think a lot of people thought it was going to be competitive, and it was obviously. And but we'll find out, right? And is it an indictment on the ACC as a whole? You know, is the ACC a little watered down? I don't think so. I think just. Georgia Tech's, you know, Florida State's not what they were last year. Georgia Tech has elevated themselves. And there's a few other teams that are going to have something to say about it before it's all said and done. I think this is a great example of how the transfer portal and the way all this works isn't an instant panacea for your football team because their quarterback, Florida State, I'm talking about, is DJ Ui Ungalale. Said that right. And he has been in the he has been in college for what seems like forever. This is his third school now. And you just can't plug a guy in and expect there to be magic. I mean, sometimes it happens, but I don't know if DJ is the guy to be able to do that. A lot of things worked well at Oregon State. It's a completely different coaching staff. Or I, actually, wait a minute. Did Oregon State's coach go to, or where, where did he go? Do you remember? He went to Michigan State. Michigan State. Okay, never mind. But either way, right? You can't just plug and play and have it all of a sudden work. Watching the game, Florida State looked, for lack of a better term, constipated. Like they didn't know what they wanted to do. Some of that was Georgia Tech. Some of that was themselves. And week one is always really, really tough. But I think this is more an indictment on DJ than anything else. Because this is third school. And they tried to convince us that he'd finally found his fit. Not saying that their year is over. But the way that it looked there, I mean, it doesn't look like the right fit to me. Well, we saw it at Clemson, we saw it at Oregon State, and, I, and we're already seeing it at Florida State, and that's the uh, lack of consistency on DJ's end of the deal. Yes. Because when he's on, man, he's good. Uh, but he has not shown the ability to... Um, I mean, the ceiling's really high, but the floor is also very low. And unfortunately, that's not going to cut it at this level. Not with, if you, when you're expected to compete for uh, national championships. It didn't cut it at Clemson. Right on the heels of Trevor Lawrence, he was supposed to, you know, he was the heir apparent and uh, couldn't get it done. Um, you know, we he, they have a long season ahead of them. We'll see. Maybe he bounces back. Maybe Georgia Tech goes undefeated and, can, and makes a run for a national championship. Who knows, right? Um, but it, it doesn't look good at this point in time. And I think, too, one thing we're seeing, and this is without a ton of research, like most other things that I say. Perfect. The the whole free agency concept that has come along with NIL on the transfer portal in college football, um, I don't know that it works the same way in college football that it does in the pros. I think in the pros, they're, they're pros, right? Um, they tend to be better at drowning out distractions, outside noise. It's their full-time job for crying out loud. They don't have to go to class or, or anything else. 
There's no other distractions. They're not trying to get themselves to the NFL because they're already there. And so this dynamic of the transfer portal and this free agency that exists now, it's not so easy to just plug and play no. with a guy because mm-hmm. there are a lot of factors that you have to consider and a lot of things that have to come together in order to achieve success. Well, when you plug a free agent, let's take an offensive lineman into an offensive line, as you said, they're all professionals. And even if there's a rookie, even if you are a rookie, you've played a lot of football up until that point and you've reached that pinnacle. And what is asked of you as a professional is different. But when you go from college to college, the roster depth it from top to bottom is not consistent across the board. Whereas if, when you come from, let's say, a Colorado, you go to Florida State or what have you, the guys that are around you may all be about where you are, or maybe they won't be. What if you're on an offensive line with all freshmen? I mean, that happens these days now. And those kids, those freshmen, no matter what high school they play that, it's not Division I college football. Like, if you go from some high school and then start playing at Alabama, the expectations are super, super high when you get there. Or if you're transferring from, like, Jackson State all the way until Alabama, it's a completely different ballgame. And so I think there's so many differing scenarios, so many differing situations, especially in coaching, the disparity or the chasm between the haves and the have-nots, even within Division One, is pretty large, and it doesn't exist in the NFL. Well, even when you consider the stuff that exists um, around the program, right, boosters yes. and everything else, um, there's a big difference between being the quarterback at Oregon State and being the quarterback at Florida State. You know, when you talk about expectations and oh, booster yeah. influence and all this other stuff, uh, where there's not that much of a difference between being the quarterback for the Denver Broncos um, or the Chicago Bears. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, not really. Uh, it just, there's a, a lot of these pro organizations, like they're, they're for, the rules keep it very, there's a lot of parity as far as how these organizations function. And, you know, there's a few places I think it is a little different. Uh, Cowboys, you know, stuff like that, where there's just a weird expectation that exists. But uh, in college, like there are places that it's like being on the moon compared to other universities. And I mean, he was at Clemson. So like the pressure and the spotlight shouldn't be really a big adjustment. But compared to Oregon State, it certainly is. And I'm sure there's other scenarios um, where you could kind of look at that comparison and see how it would impact someone and make it difficult to just sort of plug and play. So I think that this result isn't necessarily indicative of Georgia Tech or Florida State. I think what it is is that it's week one. We don't really know a whole lot, but we go off of the preseason rankings, which you said last week could hurt or help a team. In this case, it really hurts Florida State because they were so high up, a lot of expectations. But you talked about the ACC and whether this is an indictment on the ACC. Well, another team in the ACC played this weekend, that was SMU. And while I believe they squeaked by with the W, they did not look good. And maybe, just maybe, these teams that were added to the ACC are actual bottom feeders, and they're not going to help out the conference in the now. Wow, SMPU, man. Yes. Like, that was bad. Um, I was, I, I watched the game, you know, and I like during college football season especially, five bucks on a game here, five bucks on a game there, just for fun. Here it comes out now. I thought that SMU was going to go out there and at least offensively be able to assert themselves. And I even like went above and beyond what the normal line was as far as point, you know, as far as a spread. And I mean, I mean, it didn't take but 10 minutes and I knew that 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 $5 was gone, but uh, (laughs) just watching the way the game was going. But yeah, I mean, if that's, if that's what they're, that's the effort they're going to put forth, they're in trouble. Um, in the ACC, because there are good football teams in the ACC. They get, they get a lot of people like to pile on the ACC, especially now that the Pac-12 is gone. Now, granted, Pac-12 was very good last year, but historically speaking, you know, they've kind of been the the redheaded stepchild of the power conferences, and now it's like the ACC gets to carry that torch. But you know, they've got some national championships here in the last decade, so I mean, you you can't really crap on them too much. You know, Clemson's been good. Miami's supposed to be back. We'll see. Always. Um, obviously, Florida State, Georgia Tech's looking good this year. Virginia Tech looks like they are having a resurgence. So, I mean, they're, North Carolina's had some really good football teams. Yes. You know, Duke under Mike Elko was very competitive. You know, so there are Louisville. I mean, there, there are teams in that league that are, that are very good and competitive. Yeah, I mean, whatever. Every team has their duds, you know. I mean, the SEC has Vanderbilt. ACC has Virginia. 
So <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, my God. I think the ACC, though, to what you talked about with the Big 12, is a lot of B-tier teams where there is a lot of solid teams or are a lot of solid teams, but not many teams that can consistently make you feel that they belong at the top. And even the winner of the ACC, like last year, I mean, obviously it was Florida State, and they would have been in the playoff. But a couple of years, if you're talking about Clemson winning it, they had like two losses, so not really a lot of fear stri stricken in people with the ACC. I think that's where the ACC gets a bad rap in that. I hope that that will change as this landscape changes a little bit, and I hope that maybe they're able to get out there on the recruiting trail. And I think what would help is the resurgence of some of these programs like a Miami, like a Virginia Tech to stay consistently good. I mean, I don't know if people remember this, but Virginia Tech and Miami were battling it out in the early 2000s when they were both in the Big East. It was who's going to win, Miami, Virginia Tech. And that 2001 Miami team, I say this all the time, best football team I ever saw play live. It was still the best game I've ever been to, even though we lost. I mean, those were great times, right? When those programs were at the top, even when we moved in, we won, I think, like three ACC championships before Frank Beamer started falling off a little bit. And that's when the landscape started changing. And so you kind of hope that this conference can get a little bit of momentum. They certainly have it in basketball. Can they get it in football? But so if you think about it, right, this is the SMU's debut in the ACC, DJ Uyangale's debut at Florida State, and the coach with one of the greatest names in all of college folk football, Bronco Mendenhall, had his coaching debut at, I believe it was New Mexico. And they had a 31 to 14 lead in the fourth quarter and lost to Montana State, I believe at home to Montana State. Quote me, I can't remember if that's correct, but I think they were at home. Uh, let me tell yeah. you something. That is not a good way to start your coaching tenure, no matter where it is that you're coaching. Yeah, not good. Now, in their defense, Montana State's a very strong FCS they football are. program. They are. Um, so it wasn't like they lost to the Sisters of the Poor by any means. No. Nope. But, you know, you are big-time Division One school. You are a Division One coach that's got a lot of experience. That's not a game that you want to start your tenure off with, losing to an FCS school, no matter how good they are. And it was, I, I want to say that Montana State had, they scored 28 the unanswered or something yeah. to finish the game. It was something like that. Yeah, it was uh, unforgivable. I mean, it was just like, good, did you just quit? Uh, that's what it felt like. And there was, I mean, it's just, it was so weird. I mean, it's college football, so it makes it great. But the amount of, I guess, upsets uh, that occurred or near upsets uh, in week zero was somewhat surprising to me because not a lot of those matchups were supposed to be overly competitive by any means. One thing I've noticed over the last, maybe it's been a decade, maybe less time, is that those FCS teams have really crept up and come closer to the bottom third of, or excuse me, the FBS teams. Is that what it is? I, God, I'm, I'm really off today. It's FCS. It's F is FCS. It's below. football championship. They're, right. they're the ones that have like the 32 team playoff, which yes. is wonderful. I'm really off tonight with this. Anyway, the you're FCS good, teams are getting up to the FBS teams, and you're seeing a lot more competitiveness with these games. Whereas in 2007, when App State beat Michigan at the big house, that was a big deal because that never happened. And then JMU beats Virginia Tech at Lane Stadium, and you start seeing more and more of these schools, and even some of them now jumping up from FCS to FBS. And so I certainly was not taking anything away from Montana State. And hell, how about the rare loss that is a win? Your Hornets, Delaware State, flying all the way over to Hawaii to actually cover the spread. And very easily, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I told everyone. I'm not surprised, obviously. But um, I will. Yes, you are. And, and <laughs> full transparency. I didn't watch a second of that game. Oh, it was on honestly, at like 11 o'clock. What are you talking about? Like, like forgot it happened until like noon the next day. And I looked up the score. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it last week when I made the pick. Hawaii, uh, beautiful place. But that's about the nicest thing I could say about them. And <laughs> Delaware State, again, uh, FCS traveling back in time to take on Hawaii. You know, obviously had the missed flight situation. I knew that wouldn't be a factor. I know the Delaware State Hornets, my Delaware State Hornets, would overcome adversity. Uh, those men are cut out for this sort of uh, this sort of thing, and 
I, I'm very proud of the boys. They went out there, fought hard, covered the spread, maintained the record at three and zero, and I I don't know what else could even be said about it. That is a valiant effort, though. I mean, after everything that they went through, missing flights, having to t- still take that flight all the way over there to show out in that way to where you don't get blown out because the spread actually started creeping up and up as the days started getting closer to the game. And it's like, wow, maybe they really are going to get blown out. To me, that's a perfect example of that's an indictment on Hawaii. No doubt. Yeah. Oh, yes. Like Absolutely. totally. And by the it way, we, the, the, this game is not on our list, but Hawaii now gets to host UCLA this week. So it ain't going to get any easier. Game. Bounce oh, back game. Yeah, yeah, right. A bounce back <laughs> game. And this is not a team that's going to have to travel for 10 hours. They're going to take a four hour flight. This is very easy. A lot of people do it. And UCLA is probably going to have a field day with the bows. Yeah, uh, they're in trouble. That's for sure. But if there is a place that I think I've never been to Hawaii, but I, by all accounts, it's a beautiful place, right? If there's a place that I think I could cope with losing, I think it would be um, on <laughs> the Hawaii. beaches of Oahu. Um, I think I'd be just fine. I think you would. So let's start moving to this coming week because there really wasn't a lot this weekend to to chew the fat on. But let's talk about college game day for a second because last week you did not know or realize that Nick Saban was going to be a permanent fixture on college game day. And so while college game day was in Dublin and it was a nice backdrop, you and I both agreed that it didn't feel like college game day, didn't feel Uh-oh. the same because college game days to me for the most part should be on a campus or they should be adjacent to a campus, depending on where this campus is, of course. And so it didn't didn't feel right to me. And I believe Lee Corso was not in Dublin. I mean, obviously he's you know very old at this point, so traveling out there. So you kind of got to see, in my opinion, what the future could look like for college game day. And I wanted to ask you how you felt Nick Saban fit in. I I thought he fit in just fine. I think that he's a perfect contrast to Pat McAfee. I mean, and the two of them seem to like have oddly good chemistry they for do. being as opposite as they are. And then, you know, so you have those two guys. And then, of course, you know, Kirk Herbstreet is just a mainstay and you got Desmond. And, I, you know, those guys are staples. But the fact that you have two personalities that couldn't be further apart on the spectrum, sitting right next to each other, playing off of each other, coexisting. I mean, just, uh, it was solid gold, in my opinion. And to talk about the feel of it, and the crowd, which was not what we're used to seeing at a, a typical college game day, it just goes to show that football, specifically college football, is a uniquely American thing. That you know, and it just I think goes to really show the passion that we as Americans have for college football and the pageantry and traditions that it, that surround it. You know, of course, there were fo- some folks that came out and. I, I'm certain that a good portion of that crowd were probably American fans that traveled, but yes. I, I don't doubt that there were locals that were participating. But for the most part, man, like I'm sure they were just like passerbys, you know, oh, this is cool. Hey, let's holler here for a minute and go have a go have a pint. I did think it was great though during the broadcast that they were like bringing Guinnesses to like the broadcast crew, the cameramen. Like, I was like, this is wonderful. I mean, if there's one thing that game day does well, it's impeccably produced. It is one of the best sports shows on television, probably is the be- one of the best. But the thing about Pat McAfee, I don't think he gets enough credit for how seriously he does take his job in college football. And watching him talk with Nick Saban, even though on a personality scale, they are very different, I think they vibed off of each other because I think that Nick Saban knows there is a respect that comes from Pat McAfee, not just of Nick Saban, but of the job that he's doing of college football. I mean, Pat McAfee played college football. And I think that Nick Saban, now that he no longer has the shackles of having to be a head coach, say the right things, representing a university, he can kind of say what's on his mind and we can get the real Nick Saban. And let's let's face it, Nick Saban has a lot of insight that he can provide. And I think that over the course of the season, he's only going to get better. But to go to your comp about how college is uniquely American, I think that college football, the way that we do it, is the closest thing that we have to like the Premier League in soccer with that kind of fandom. Nowhere near that kind of fandom, but something that has been entrenched for so long in a geographic area that it's just something that means, it means something completely different than say a pro football team. That's probably the closest comp that I can think of. No, that's a great comparison. And um, to circle back on the McAfee and Saban talk, I think what we're going to see, I mean, I think people get mad about 
McAfee's, I guess, shtick, if that's what you're going to call it. Yes. But you have to understand, like, he's being paid to be that person. Correct. You know, like, it, if they had a problem with his behavior, like, it would be addressed. Like, you you know, I, I do think that he, he definitely has gotten more more leeway, more freedom, is able to take more liberty than anyone else in the history of ESPN. Like, no, no doubt about that. But they understand how valuable that is. What's fun about it is his personality. We're, he's going to be able to bring out some of that, some of Nick Saban's like real personality. And, and you know, and you're going to get to see him sort of peel back the layers of Nick Saban as this season goes on. And I do think it was, it's funny to watch how he interacts with Nick Saban compared to the others because he does. There, there's a certain bit of, there's just an added like respect in his, uh, in his approach to addressing Nick Saban about things, even with, you know, he, he does still put his own Pat McAfee twist on it, but like it's different than if he's talking to Kirk Herbstreet or, or one of the others, you know what I mean? And, and it's just, you can tell that that respect exists, but I do think we're going to see, like I said, we're going to get the curtain pulled back on Nick Saban a little bit as the season goes on. And I'm, I'm super pumped about that. It's going to be fun to see. I am too. Like, I just feel like I'm going to learn something from him and that every so often we're going to get a little nugget that maybe we didn't know. And what I'm hopeful for is that maybe he'll tell some stories. Maybe we'll actually get some stories of things that happened on the recruiting trail that is relevant to what they're talking about. But I think that a lot of people feel a certain way. Like last year, we said that people thought that Lee Corso should have gone by the wayside and the thing is, Pat McAfee is kind of Lee Corso. He's just a little bit different. He didn't coach. And Lee Corso, over the course of his career, has been the silly guy that's been on the show, right, with the the mascot helmets and everything. And Pat McAfee just does it in a different way. But I think you're right. He's paid to do that. He's paid a lot of money to do that on ESPN television, period. And he's there to put eyeballs on the product. And I think it doesn't matter whether they're eyeballs that like him or don't like him. They just want eyeballs on the product. And it's Reese Davis's job to make sure that everybody does what they're supposed to do. And he does an impeccable job at doing that. And so that's why I think they can afford to have a team like that. And I think that this Dublin series was sort of a glimpse of the future, perhaps, because Lee Corso can't have that many years left. But either way, it's college game day, and I love it. Yeah, I mean, you got you think about it. You got the perfect mix that represents everything great about college football. Obviously, when you talk about Lee Corso, you've got what I would, you know, you got the godfather of like college football, modern media, right? In, in terms of what he represents. And, you know, he, you know, was a coach and just the history that comes along with him. And then you have Kirk Herbstreet and Desmond Howard. You have to Ohio State, Michigan, right there, represented. You have Nick Saban, the, the greatest, likely the greatest college football coach ever to this point in time. SEC roots, winning national championships in the SEC. Then you have Pat McAfee, the guy you know that from Pittsburgh that went to West Virginia. You know that that played for one of those programs that's not a nationally known, historically great program, but had a really good stretch while he was there. Um, you know, played for sort of like a, a I don't want to say polarizing, but unique, interesting coach and in Rich Rodriguez. I mean, there there was a lot of storylines that followed that team. The guy who played with some great pros, uh, like Morgan Town, West Virginia. Is a, is a unique place, right? And so, I mean, just at, at West Virginia, I mean, you know, Pat White, Steve Slayton, and some of those guys that he played with there were incredible. Pat White was um, insane. Pac, Pac-Man Jones. <laughs> so just the, the stories that guy has are, are just off the charts. So you, you just get a little bit, right, from all these, these different pieces of college football history and like what makes it up. And I think that's what makes it so special. And then, yeah, Reese Davis is just masterful and the way that he brings it all together. Uh, he's he's absolutely great. He's, he's a pro. And, um, you know, you, you should just make sure you're always waiting, man, in case he's a little under the weather one day and you can hop right in there and take over. I definitely couldn't do his job. That is a seasoned professional's job. But sticking with the media, and of course, we're going to talk about Colorado, but we're going to talk about Coach Prime here. And it's actually something that you, Brad, have been in my ear about for the last few days. And Obviously, the offseason is all about preseason rankings and, you know, publications are doing their their job to talk about who's the best coach, who's the worst coach, blah, 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 blah. Well, apparently Coach Prime doesn't really have time for being told he's the second worst coach in the Big 12 by a reporter. And from what I understand, that reporter was then, I believe, barred from asking questions or barred from a media event. Uh, I don't know a lot of the details around it other than what we've been told, but what I can tell you is that if 
the facts of this are exactly as we're being presented, that he saw this ranking, didn't like it, and asked this person not to come by. To me, that is weak, but I feel like there probably is a little bit more, but I know that you are in agreement. There may be more, but we have been, you know, staunch Coach Prime supporters here. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, this one, I'm not on his side. I think this is soft. You cannot be, you cannot put yourself out there the way he has, the way his program has, and and be out there pounding your chest and have all this swag and then balk at the first sign of someone pushing back in some way. And it's not like they're even pushing back. It's not, this isn't even a personal attack. They're not attacking like your behavior or your appearance or the way you carry yourself. They're just simply addressing what they perceive <laughs> their evaluation of your coaching ability, which when you accept those types of jobs, you are, <laughs> you put yourself out there to be judged and criticized for how you perform. And frankly, he hasn't performed very well in that department. So I do. I think it's it's really weak and it's really soft the way he handled it and reacted. You can't be loud and then get mad when the noise comes back at you. Well, especially when this is, again, as you said, this is an, a ranking of his coaching. We're talking about him as a coach. Now, all the other stuff, the hype, getting people to buy season tickets, getting people to buy merch, all that stuff. I mean, he does a very good job at getting that kind of stuff to happen. There is a hype that existed around Colorado football that hadn't existed there in, what, 30 years? Something like that. But when you're a coach, even if you don't like the paradigm or maybe you don't like the reporter or whatever, I mean, there is sort of a standard operating procedure that comes along the with all this. And just because he said you're the second worst, if you don't believe it, then you know it, you don't believe it. You just say, look, I'm gonna prove you wrong this year. But barring people from a press conference, to me, it gives off the image that maybe they're a little bit nervous, that maybe he's feeling a little bit of the pressure because they've been talking a little bit more. And now we know that Shadur Sanders has an NIL deal with Nike. And I sent that to you and said, they better win. And all of this is fine as long as they win. And again, we're still staunch Coach Prime supporters. I think that college football is better off if he does well, but he's got to do it. He's got to deliver. Yeah, I'm all about, you know, if you want to try to go about things in a different way than any, anyone ever has, like, I'm here for it, man. Like, I'm not going to say, like, no, you need to fit in this certain mold. We said that last year. I, I'm all about trying to shake things up a little bit and show it can be done a different way. But you got to win. The results have to be there. Now, I will, I will say this about, the Shadur NIL deal with Nike. And we'll see how it plays out ultimately. But like, even if they don't win because of the personality and everything that surrounds this program, I, I don't know that you're going to lose eyeballs. Now you might, but at what point do you think, at what point, if the winning doesn't come, at what point does do all the antics and things start to wear people out where they stop watching? The media stops talking. Um, they they become more of a punchline instead of a headline. When when what's the breaking point for that to happen? Uh, I'm not sure what that is. I'm curious of your opinion, but I think in the meantime, the attention is still you know the eyes are still on the Colorado program. So I don't think it's a bad investment by Nike. No no no, I don't think means. it is either. But, but it may not work out as well as they hope. I don't think it is either, and he should get his money, but in the sort of advertisement for this, it's a picture of him showing off his watch, which is something that we talked about last week, that they were doing that stuff and losing and saying, you know what time it is. And that's why I'm like, they better win because that's what you need. I mean, for Nike, it's a fine investment for Schnur. I'm very happy for him. Obviously, it's good for Colorado in general. I mean, Deion Sanders is already a Nike athlete or was a Nike athlete, so there is a natural progression that goes along there. However, I just feel like you're right. The antics need to match the or the the field, the play on the field need to match the antics. And I'm just getting a little bit more and more nervous that we're not going to see that happen because I think that Colorado this year is going to need to really take a step up in how they approach this from a professional standpoint. Last year, all the eyeballs, all the people going to their games, all the swag, totally good. But when they got punched in the mouth the last part of the season, this is the year they got to put the work in. And I know that they're working hard. We both know they're working hard. But I feel like they've got to almost approach it as if it's professional. And when they start racking up wins, then the swag can kind of come out as long as they're still doing that. These are the things that just make me a little nervous. You've got 
Deion Sanders getting mad that some co some reporter said that he's not a great coach and you got all these NIL deals and we're still seeing the swag and the flash. Haven't played a game yet. And they've got a tough game this weekend, a really tough game this weekend against what is a notable giant killer. Yeah, no, they absolutely do. And But at the same time, I think it's exactly where Dion and the boys want to be, where people are doubting them. And I can only imagine what sort of chip they have on their shoulder with people doubting them against an FCS opponent, uh, of all things, let, you know, let alone TCU last year, who was coming off an appearance in the national championship. Um, you know, this is quite the contrast to that. And, uh, but, you know, we, you know, you're not, we talked about last week, you're not sneaking up on anyone anymore. Everybody knows what to expect. Everyone knows Shadur is the real deal. Everyone knows that Travis Hunter may be the best all around athlete in college football. Um, but you need more than that. And have they done enough to put players around those guys to consistently play at a high level? You know, have they done enough to keep Shadur off his back? I mean, the guy, the guy didn't even, uh, unknowingly, he didn't realize he was an astronomy major at Colorado. The guy spent so much time staring at the stars. Um, I mean, he's going to have a minor in astronomy just, just from uh, playing on Saturdays. You know, so have they shirt up the offensive line so he can exhibit and utilize his talents uh, to help the team and not be running for his life? And, and then obviously defensively, they had a lot of things they need to improve on. And we'll see if they've done that. What do you make of North Dakota State only being 10-point underdogs against Colorado? It's fair. I think it's fair. I mean, North Dakota State's very sound. They're very very fundamentally sound. The moment's not going to be too big for them. Um, I, I don't think, you know, they play games like this every year. You know, a lot of these FCS schools do. These guys have played at the highest level of their division. Uh, they've won FCS national championships. And so going to Boulder... The play coach prime and the boys isn't something they're going to um, balk at by any means. And I, I think it's a fair spread. I really do. And I'm sure that Colorado coach prime and company aren't in love with the spread, but I, I think it's perfectly fair considering the way that Colorado season ended and the history that's there with uh, North Dakota state. Colorado has to come out and really put it to them early, establish themselves. If we're talking late in the second quarter, and it's like 17 to seven North Dakota State, gonna hear some chirping. And not from us, but like this is this is the kind of game that makes me so, so nervous. But we're gonna get plenty of Colorado, just a lot of things to talk about with them because they're constantly bringing us content, constantly in the news. And this is the first time that we have been anti what Coach Prime has done. But I think overall, he's done a good job of bringing the hype there, bringing the eyeballs and hopefully the wins can come. So the Big Ten obviously added some teams as we talked about last week. I think it's an 18-team conference now, and one of the things they've done is they've ditched divisions, and other conferences have done this as well. I believe the ACC has moved to this model, and the Big Ten announced all their tiebreakers and stuff. Some people feel like the divisions meant something and that they should keep them. I personally believe that it should just be the top two teams in a conference playing for the conference championship. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on that because I think this is going to be something we're going to see a lot more of. I, I think that the, vi the divisions mostly are a joke because just, I don't know, you're, they're broke up geographically. It's just, I mean, how many times did Iowa play in the Big Ten championship game? Too many. Just because of the division they happen to be in. And they, they may maybe weren't even realistically the fourth best team in the conference. Um, in some cases, but they got to uh, have a crack at a conference championship. Um, now they didn't ever pull it off to the point where uh, you know they they were able to play spoiler. But I, I do wonder if the twelve team playoff maybe led to people being more willing to do this because I think maybe you wanted to like at least give the hope to people like, hey, if we get to the conference championship and win it, like how are they? You know, if um, like LSU. It was like because when LSU played uh, Alabama a couple years ago or whatever, and it's like, hey, if LSU wins the SEC, like, how do you not put them in the yeah, cause we're talking college about them football as a playoff three loss know? team? Like, yeah, I mean, it's like, well, how do you not do it? You know, um, where now if if a three loss LSU or whatever that finished the season strong probably gets in a twelve team playoff, so you don't have to give them that opportunity. Where that might be why that existed with divisions possibly i don't know but i'm a big fan of no divisions let's see the two best teams play 
But also, I think the 12-team playoff does sort of, outside of the bye, obviously you get the bye, which is very helpful, especially if you're playing in a conference championship game. But it's not as valuable to win the conference necessarily uh, as it once was, maybe. Well, because you have to play an extra game. Yeah, that too, right? I mean, it's like, I'd almost prefer, I think, if you were a top team in the league, if you're Georgia and you're playing an SEC schedule all year, and you're like, man, I got to go play Alabama again. Again, Or whoever, yes. you know, like, um, and then maybe play them again in a couple weeks. <laughs> no, I, I would think that I'd want to forgo that if I could and, and not bother. But, you know, we'll kind of see. I, I think this is all still evolving, so we'll see where it goes. But uh, for now, I'm happy that they've gotten rid of the, rid of the divisions and are just going to take the top two teams. In college basketball, I used to be anti-conference tournaments. But now, at least, I see some semblance of value of allowing teams to pad their resume a little bit or get a, a really big win on their resume. But even in the NCAA tournament, I told you that I feel like a lot of times it's, well, if they win two games in this tournament, they're in. And it's like, well, what happened to the rest of their schedule? Whereas in football, the results are so finite because the game is so difficult. So there's less games. And I feel like as... You say, if Georgia goes through the SEC and beats all the cream of the crop, why should they have to do it again outside of money? It seems kind of silly to me, especially now with a 12-team playoff where, okay, we know, hey, Georgia wins the SEC, so they get a bye. And the rest of the teams that are going to be in the SEC, I mean, shit, we could have how many teams from the SEC actually make the playoff because I feel like four or five are in the top 12 by the time we get to the end of it. Maybe if anything, you, whoever wins the regular season, you just, okay, that's an auto bid to the playoff. And then you play the number two and number three in the conference play in the, what was the conference championship game. And now you can call it the conference playoff play in game or whatever, but a chance to like do enough to enhance your resume to get into the playoff. And in the SEC, I don't think it matters as much, but in the ACC, it would. Sure. You know, if you were guaranteed, if you were the number three team in the ACC and you were guaranteed a berth if you win that game over the number two team, like, that, that's more intriguing than watching 12-0 and Clemson and 12-0 and Miami or whatever, you know, may work out. Because, you know, they're both probably going to get in anyways. And yeah. so... Let, let's see a game that actually has a little, you know, something riding on it. Yeah, there could be some tweaks. By the way, today... I had this realization. It's not going to happen, but I was like, well, what is the ceiling for Virginia Tech this year? Well, maybe what if they win 10 games? And then I realized, oh my God, if they win 10 games, they might be on the periphery of the playoff, which is kind of insane. It's not outside. I mean, I there's people who think that they, they're legit contenders in the ACC to win it. Sure, but I'm, I'm just saying like this new playoff system, it, it dawned on me today that, well, if they win 10 games, they might actually make the playoff, which is just nuts because... I haven't associated them with the playoff ever because they've never even come close to sniffing the playoff because of how hard it was and difficult it was. But now that it's larger, it's like, wow, maybe I actually have something to look forward to if Brent Pry can get things on the roll. We'll Dude, see. Dude, it's so just imagine this, okay? It's December 20, whatever. And I don't know, let's say Oregon is coming to Blacksburg to play in the first round of the college football playoff. That'd be amazing. How freaking incredible would that be? Um, or insert whoever, Texas. I mean, I mean, you name it. I mean, it, it, depending on what kind of season they have, it, it's within the realm of possibility. That's one thing that does stink, I think. If you get a buy, you miss out on like getting to host a home playoff game. I will tell you something right but, now. This will go up on TikTok, but... If Blacksburg, Virginia ever hosts a playoff game, it will be one of the greatest atmospheres in college football history because if there's ever a town that would be ready for that moment, it is Lane Stadium in Blacksburg, Virginia. It would be incredible. I was watching videos earlier, some games I've been to, some games I haven't been to, and it's like, I'm just, I'm ready. I'm ready for that town to explode again because we're talking about it in a group chat and it's like, I mean, we were lucky we were there when we were there. 2001, 2006, they were always in the top 15, always in the top 10. I remember Miami coming to town three times while I was there, always ranked in the top 10. Just powder keg games, national spotlight, game day outside. I miss that. I miss that for that town. And you said, what if Georgia Tech goes undefeated? Well, if that's the case, I will be there on October 26th for when undefeated Georgia Tech comes to Lane Stadium. And my goodness, that could be epic because James will be with me. Yes, dude, that would be. I hope, I hope that Virginia Tech gets that opportunity, man. Like, 
to to play a game of that magnitude. And I think they're going to they're going to get a couple shots at it this year. They might, I think, um, which is wonderful. They're on the upswing. Let's put it that way. But we got to get yeah. you to a game in Blacksburg, and I have to go to a game Would where you to. are right now, sitting in front of Touchdown Jesus over there. <laughs> so let's get to Week One, okay? There's a lot of matchups happening. Twenty twenty seven. Yes, in in earnest. Week one is here. So I think the one that everybody's going to be talking about, Clemson and Georgia. Now, Georgia is a 13 and a half point favorite. I think that makes a lot of sense. This is kind of a an early litmus test for Dabo's Tigers because they're going to be playing the cream of the crop. Now, maybe this is a litmus test for Georgia, but I told you, I think that Kirby's going to have the boys ready to go, chip on his shoulder. This is a national spotlight game. I think it's more important for Clemson to look good than it is for Georgia to look good. But what do you think? Well, we've heard all this pissing and moaning from the Florida State fan base, right, for the last however many months. You know who's just been quiet Georgia. this whole time that also got snubbed? Go dogs. Georgia. And I would I if I'm Clemson, like I do not want to play this game. I would not if if like last year you could be like, I could play anyone in the country week one. Like I would rather go play at anywhere else in the country week one than to have to play Georgia after what happened at the end of last season. I, I, I mean, this is just not a, uh, this is not the type of game that I want to be in if I'm Clemson. Now, I tell you what, though, if Clemson comes out and like their game, I might change my opinion on Clemson a little bit. Yeah, exactly. This is that kind of game where I do think we're going to find out what Dabo's made of. Here, because I, I, and you and I both agree that he's not in the hot seat, but I think the seat's getting warmer, and yes. they need to perform in games like this. And we're going to find out because Georgia they recruit always, and Dabo only recruits one way. And we're going to find out now. This is the SEC. This is the ACC. And if the ACC wants to feel like they're part of the big boy table, they're going to have to out. They're going to have to perform in this game, even if they lose. If they lose on a last second field goal, fine, right? They took it to Georgia, but I'm with you. Georgia is gonna be ready for this game because they haven't said a word. And I believe that they were more entitled to bitch and moan yeah. for eight months, personally. Yes, I agree. And this is the deal though too with Dabo. If you're not gonna play the portal game, you gotta develop players. And you know you don't have, I mean, Cade Klubnik may turn out to be a very good player for you, but he's not. Trevor Lawrence, he's not Deshaun Watson. Um, obviously, DJ has. I think he's sort of let you off the hook because he's proven that he, you know, that that's maybe more of a DJ problem than a Dabo problem when he was at Clemson. So, can you show that your program that can develop a quarterback, you know, that that's not necessarily a pro talent, a generational talent? And I think that this is your chance. You know, Cade, you you chose Cade. He's your boy. This is the guy you're going to ride or die with. Yep. You know, where is he? You know, he had a lot of room to grow after last season. And so is he ready for the big time or not? We will we will certainly find out oh, this we are, weekend. <laughs> we are definitely going to find out. And he might be the newest astronomy major if he's not careful out there. But <laughs> yeah. two other programs in college towns that I think are very unique, obviously Penn State and Happy Valley. And of course, you talked about Morgantown of West Virginia. Now, Penn State is going to be taken. James Franklin always has a stout defense, always has a stout team. It's offensively that they struggled last year mightily. West Virginia kind of surprised some people. And if there is a town that's going to be ready to have a Big Ten school come their way, it's Morgantown. They got those couches ready to roll. Yeah, there's going to be couches stacked up, ready to be set ablaze in the streets of Morgantown on uh, Saturday night. No doubt about that. I think that I, I love it. Uh, credit to both these teams for scheduling this game. Um, these are the type of non-conference games that I want to see being scheduled. Um, you know, going into a tough environment. You know, West Virginia hasn't been maybe like where they were in the McAfee days that like we talked about earlier, but I do think that they are maybe on the upswing a little bit. Morgantown is is a tough place to play, especially 100%. when they got it, especially when they got it going a little bit. And I think that to this point, in my opinion, James Franklin and Penn State have only won the games they were supposed to win. Mm -hmm. Like they have yet to really, they, he it does not have a signature win in my opinion. You know, he, and so I don't know that this would necessarily qualify, but it would be a step in that direction to show that like, 
hey, we can go into a tough environment against a good football team and get the W. Uh, he hasn't necessarily proven to be able to do that to this point in time. So, I mean, and there again, there's a, there's a lot left to be seen out of them. They're very good. They're very very good. You know, and, but like, always as of right now, that's all they are. Uh, they have not been able to take that next step. And I think them being able to get a win in Morgantown would be setting the ball in motion in the right direction. And another program that, actually two programs that really need this weekend, you got Miami, who is actually ranked in the preseason top 25, traveling to the Swamp to face Billy Napier and the Gators. And I love these interstate matchups, always do. They matter in the state of Florida, believe it or not. And I think that Cristobal needs it more. But Florida, I would argue, is one of those programs that has expectations every year. And they kind of overachieved with Anthony Richardson, but they've really kind of been middling in mediocrity for quite a while, ever since Urban Meyer left. And this is not going to be easy for Miami. If Cristobal and the boys are going to set the right tone for this season, they're going to have to do it in a super hostile environment against a fan base that is very similar to Blacksburg and that they are just hoping and praying for a nationally relevant program. I don't know. I think there's a reason why Florida is, I think, is Florida, that it's only like two and a half, I think, is the spread. Like, it's very, very small. So it's almost even. It's tight. And I think that um, this is very important for Mario Cristobal. Florida is perceived to be down this year. Yes. And the, the, the first step at the U is to do what Howard Schnellenberger did. That's win the state of Florida. And to do that, You've got to take care of the Gators. This is if you can't do it this year when when they are where they are currently as a program, I, I don't know if you're the guy for that job and have to go on the road and do it at their place. I believe is, yep. is going to be difficult. You know, that's another place, right? The swamp is not an easy place to play. No, and uh, I, I that's one reason I put that game down is is being a big game, is I think this is a a very important game and impactful game to Mario Cristobal's future as the head coach at the University of Miami. I 100% agree with you. And in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Kalen DeBoer, his first game as Alabama head coach, they'll be hosting Western Kentucky. Now, 31 and a half point spread. I don't think that the 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 result of this game is in doubt. However, I think it's more about how does Alabama look in this game? Do they look rusty? Do they come out, take care of business firmly? And are they playing with the kind of style that you, you want when you're, a new head coach and you got these players and how does Jalen Milrow look? Because I think that he did kind of ascend late in the season, but I think we saw his limitations in the Rose bowl and how does he look coming out? I think Alabama obviously should be really good here, but it's more of a, a look here on Kalen DeBoer on the sideline and how they play for him. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's very important. Um, the optics of this game uh, for Kalen DeBoer in Alabama and let, let's be fair, man. Like Alabama's not above losing these types of games. Uh, you know, I think you know Louisiana Monroe. I want to have a word um, about you know one of the saving teams they took down um, at one point in time. So it's it's a game they should win. You know, on paper, obviously they should win easily. But I'm more curious to see, as you mentioned, how does it look? Are they crisp? Do they appear to be bought in to Kalen DeBoer? Is um, you know do things seem in sync? There's just a lot to be determined, I guess. And, and maybe I'm overthinking it a little bit, but it's never easy to follow a legend. No. And, and that's what we are asking uh, Kalen DeBoer to do. And then under, you know, not just follow a legend, but you know, to be out there in front of one of the most passionate, impatient fan bases um, in all of college football. Yes, and I want to circle back because we actually did get a text to the line about the Florida Gators and how... This person feels like the Gators could be one of those teams that loses three or four and still has a chance at the playoff because they have scheduled themselves so strongly in the non-conference and obviously the SEC schedule is tough. And I don't know how true that is because I think three and four losses is going to be difficult, but if strength of schedule, all that stuff comes in, kind of like the NCAA tournament, you never know. But moving on, I know you like a good group of five matchup. Coastal Carolina has had a lot of great seasons recently. And they're going to be traveling to Jacksonville State. And that's going to be an interesting one because Jacksonville State, obviously, one of those FCS programs who's known for playing up to their competition. How does Coastal Carolina respond? And this is just another highlight for the group of five because there's a lot of really quality football teams. Yeah, Coastal Carolina, you know, they're kind of a group of five heavyweight in a way. Yep. And 
Obviously, Jacksonville State, you know, I kind of wanted that in here, too, because I knew we would talk about West Virginia and Rich Rodriguez, and now he is the head coach there. So he's getting, uh, he's getting. I think they're the Gamecocks as well, I believe. He's getting them going a little bit. And so it it's just one of those fun matchups. I think that would be a really fun game to be at as a fan because they're, they're two successful programs within their own levels. It's definitely one I'm going to kind of be keeping an eye on this weekend for sure, just because with with the expanded playoff man like you just you just never know who could keep themselves in the conversation as the season goes on and then you know i i had a buddy that went to west virginia when mcafee was there when i just got this soft spot in my heart i know this is anti you know you being a, a virginia tech fan i know that you don't subscribe to this sort of thing but i have a soft spot in my heart a little bit for west virginia and rich rodriguez you know being at a west virginia marshall game in the rich rod era um, and following that team. And so, you know, I've always just kind of kept my eye on Rich Rod. Those teams were terrific. And he was not the right coach for Michigan because I think that, <laughs> oh, he no, was. I mean, obviously the results are in on that. But my point being is the way that he coaches, the way that he wanted to to run his offense, I just don't think it was going to work in, at the time, what was a historically run first in the trenches, you know, hard, grinding, gritty football conference. And that was the Big Ten. But at a school like Jacksonville State, that could actually be a lot of fun. They have nothing to lose, run and gun. And at this point, he's in what I would consider probably the twilight of his career. Like, I don't think he's going to get a big time job before he retires. So why not go out there and have fun? And I think what impresses me about Coastal is they haven't been a program for all that long. And to ascend as quickly as they did, I have a lot of respect for that. The shots. Oh, right? yeah. The, sh- uh, the shots. You gotta love it. I know. Um, a little Rich Rod story here. Sure. Uh, this is a little rated R, but um, I uh, I used to coach high school football, and I knew some guys that went to the Michigan Coaches Clinic, or at, to a clinic where Rich Rod was speaking. There were some national clinics and stuff when he was in Michigan. And at one point in time, throughout you know this whole thing, he puts up a picture of a beautiful woman, and he goes, "Gentlemen, this is my wife. If you have a kid that can run a four three forty, he's like." You can do whatever you want to her or, or something along those lines. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, so Rich Rod, maybe not like the most upstanding human being, but the guy can coach a little football. No doubt about that. So we're now getting into some of these games here. Again, Michigan, 21 and a half point favorites hosting Fresno State. This is not your David Carr, Fresno State, but it's more about how does Michigan look coming off of po- almost post-Coedal on their national championship and Sharon Moore's first game. How do they look? I think that's really what we're looking for here, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's an eye test. So what, what are the optics like with Sharon Moore? How does he uh, kind of take the reins? Uh, that roster was decimated. Yes. Um, so what does Michigan football look like um, on the heels of everything that happened last year, not just the national championship, but all the other stuff on the outside, you know, Fresno state, you know, they've, they're one of those teams, man, they, they've had their moments. So I don't think this is a game that's again, not going to be too big for them. And it wouldn't be the first time that we've seen Michigan get knocked off in the big house by a much, what is considered to be a much inferior opponent. Since you are removed from being a Michigan fan, what would you consider success in Sharon Moore's first year? Oh man, make the playoff. I mean, just, I think that's the expectation. I mean, I, I I don't know that those are fair expectations, but I think that's what he'll be judged off of. Really? Make the playoff. Yeah. I, I, I really think that he's going to have to make the playoff. Otherwise his days are numbered. I don't think that he would get fired unless it goes really bad, but I think like two consecutive years of no playoff, depending on how bad he would be in trouble. Interesting. I was kind of wondering if maybe after a national championship, they would have given him a grace period. On it that. makes but it worse. Makes it worse, I think. You might be right. You might be right about that. So Georgia Tech and Florida State both have games now. Georgia Tech hosting Georgia State. They're obviously huge favorites, 21 and a half points. But it's, again, more about do they have a hangover from this big win? Do they let a Georgia State stay in this game or do they come out and take care of business? And Florida State, Boston College. So they get two ACC games in a row. Boston College is a team. Budge obviously has a thing with Boston College and his fans. And I I, I, I got to think that he's rooting for Florida State here because he just wants to see Boston College go down. But this is not going to be an easy game for the Knowles because Boston College, I would have to think, is smelling blood in the water and they cannot afford to start 0-2. So 
if she's not only 0-2 in the national spotlight, but 0-2 in the conference, this is a tough little sled here for Florida State. They got to come out and win this game. This is almost must win. It is must win. I think that if they lose this game, they are, I mean, again, they, they still have that like get out of jail free card of like find a way to win the conference. But you go 0-2 in conference and it gets much more difficult at that point. Really time. hard. Um, especially with the likes of Clemson and Miami and Virginia Tech. Uh, it, it gets really difficult. I do think, yeah, the ADs of both Georgia Tech and um, Florida State should be fired for scheduling, making sure there are games scheduled the week after coming back from Ireland. You talk about not putting your guys in the position to be successful. And, and maybe, especially the conference side of things, maybe it's outside of their control or whatever. But, like, man, that's just brutal. So not only does Georgia Tech have to, like, sort of, find a way to manage whatever expectations may be coming from getting that win and the hangover that may exist, but now jet lag, getting back, you know, time, you know, time zone issues, whatever else. But Georgia State is not, it's not the Kansas City Chiefs. I think no. they'll probably be okay. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what they're made of, though. If they're not, then they're not who we thought they could be. But see, this is exactly like the Florida State is exactly like when Virginia Tech played Boise State, when Boise State was in their heyday, we played at FedEx Field here. Virginia Tech lost a last second win or a last second loss. And that's when they had to host JMU at home. And JMU beat them at Lane Stadium. And they started 0 2. They still made the Sugar Bowl that year. That was, I think, against Michigan, perhaps, one of those games. But you don't want to start 0 2, man. And these are trap games, 100%. Right. Now, Florida State is a conference game. So that's a little bit different. But Georgia State, it's like, Georgia Tech's feeling really good about themselves. Everybody's been talking about them, and you could let it slip just a little bit. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And then, you know, with Florida State, man, it's they might be pressing a little bit because they know how critical it is to get a win under their belts. You know, a guy like DJ who's had some struggles, I don't think he's he's a performer, um, a high performer under these circumstances when the pressure's on. And that's not really the traits you want to see in a starting quarterback. But no. Um, <laughs> at all. Say the quiet part out loud, please. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's, um, we'll find out, man. And, and I, these are the tough, these are the type of moments where you really find out how good a coach is because it's real easy to motivate guys when things are going well and they're feeling good and whatever else. You know, Florida State's got, you know, this is probably the most adversity that Mike Norvell's faced uh, at Florida State, I would say. Now, I'm sure he had to kind of like build them back up somewhat. But, you know, he had set the expectation, set the bar, and then to come out, lose to Georgia Tech, and especially, it just wasn't like, it just wasn't a good performance at all. No, it wasn't. You know, we'll see. We'll see if he can get the boys to bounce back. So, last national game, Brian Kelly and USC with Lincoln Riley. This is probably the best coaching matchup of the weekend. We're going to see how LSU looks, losing Jaden Daniels, losing Malik Neighbors, and does USC have a defense? And obviously they lost Caleb Williams. So this is interesting because these are two programs that are known for winning, known for their tradition, and they're both losing quarterbacks. They're both coming in kind of a little bit unknown here. So this is going to be tight. LSU is a four and a half point favorite. So you ready for the parallels in this matchup? Yes, please. Brian Kelly, Lincoln Riley, both heading into year three. Yep. Brian Kelly, Lincoln Riley, both on the heels of losing Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks. Okay. Both in the process of what you consider to be a defensive rebuild, right? Last year, the defense of both teams struggled and was a serious issue. Timeout. How can you rebuild something that never existed in the first place? <laughs> a defensive build of okay, whatever you, you want to call it. Uh, I mean, but it, it's a problem that's needed to be solved by both programs. And both in a situation where if they can't get it right, pretty quick, they're going to be unemployed. And so the I don't know who who needs it more. Probably Lincoln Riley. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think I Lincoln think. Riley, no doubt. But it, it's it's so crazy to think. I mean, and even like Lincoln Riley was the guy, supposed to be the guy at LSU until all of a sudden USC came swooping in and then they moved on to Brian Kelly. So, so many parallels in this game. So many similarities between the two coaches and their situations. You know, to do it all in Vegas, man, and to uh, gosh, what what the heck, man? The the freaking name of the quarterback at USC is like it, it's a winner, and, and of course, I'm not going to be able to think about it. I'll look it up here when uh 
when I pass it back to you. He sounds like he should be like a hip hop artist, like his name. Okay. Um, I'll look it up here momentarily, but yeah, definitely an interesting matchup uh, when when you kind of look at all the the circumstances that line up. Is it fair to say that Brian Kelly maybe have has a longer leash? Because I feel like Brian Kelly almost has somewhat overachieved at LSU in some way because Coach O left them in shambles, like absolute shambles. And that first year, they were in the SEC championship game with three losses. And we were talking like, man, really? Like, are we really going to think about having them in the playoff as an SEC champion? And then Jaden Daniels last year, obviously, they had a good season, but not a great season. But Jaden Daniels kind of came out of nowhere last year to win the Heisman. And it's like, he's almost kind of done better than I think we both thought that he would. Yeah, so quarterback's name at USC, Miller Moss okay. is his name. All right. Um, his LP will be dropping next week. But yeah, yes. I think that uh, <laughs> LSU to me feels like a Ferrari that's driving down the road that's got like two lug nuts on each wheel. Like it, it's screaming fast, but like at any moment, the wheels could just go flying off. Um, it, it just seems very on the verge of like unhinged all the time is <laughs> what I feel like the LSU program is like. Yes, I think Brian Kelly does have a little bit more of a leash because you can't, you can afford to lose this game to USC and still redeem yourself within the conference because of how good the SEC is. I don't know that anyone necessarily expects you to win the Big Ten, but you've got to be able to go out of conference and like contend with the big boys. And if you just get slapped around by LSU, especially if you give up a million points like you've done historically when you've probably been tasked with fixing the defense. I would hope so. Uh, not going to bode well. And then not to get put the cart in front of the horse, but where does like USC and Lincoln Riley, where, where do they, each of them land if things do go south? You know, who knows? I don't know, but USC could find themselves near the bottom of the Big Ten real quick if they don't get it together. So this could be the start of that. Two more games to go. My Virginia Tech Hokies traveling to Vanderbilt. And I was just talking to my dad about this today. I don't have a lot of confidence in games like this. I know that traditionally Vanderbilt has been bad at football, but this is a Virginia Tech team that has a lot of expectations on them. Traveling to an SEC opponent, an opponent I don't think that they've played maybe ever, they're a 14 point or 13 and a half point favorite. So a pretty heavy favorite coming in. Lots of expectations, lots of returning players. This feels like a trap game to me. Yeah. I mean, now let's not get caught up too much on SEC opponent because it is Vanderbilt. But like the fact remains, they are an SEC opponent. Um, I think I'm hoping they finally finished whatever renovations they were doing. They were like literally building the stadium around the field last year. As yes, they were. Happening. I remember that. Um, I imagine that it's probably finished. So it'll be nice to see what that looks like. The dangerous part about this game for Virginia Tech for me is Clark Lee is a man coaching for his job at this point at Vanderbilt. I think you'll get a pass. I mean, Clark Lee, you know, at Vanderbilt, you can get a pass if you're not beating Alabama and Georgia and LSU, whatever. But like, I think you're probably expected to compete out of conference. And if you get railroaded by Virginia Tech, although a surging Virginia Tech, in my opinion, uh, that's probably not a vote in your favor. So uh, very curious to see how that transpires. But on the other side of things, what's yet to be seen, you know, is, is, you know, is this going to be the, the coronation, right, of Brent Pry? You know, is he going to be the heir um, to the Frank Beamer throne? And, and, you know, we'll find out. And I, I think that he could be. Um, those are big shoes to fill, and that's an unfair comparison. But I think that that's sort of something that's probably in the back of all Virginia Tech fans' heads is, you know, is, are we going to get this guy that's going to be the next guy we have for a decade that keeps us relevant, which is not very common these days with the kind of money that gets thrown around at these coaches. For them, you know, unfortunately, Virginia Tech's probably not a place where a coach would stay for the length of time that Frank Beamer stayed anymore even if they were having success, you know, so this is another optics test too, I think similar to Michigan, Alabama, like what does Virginia tech look, look like? like? Do they look like a contender? Um, and, and they're going to have to go on the road to do it too, which is unique. I just hope they cover. And the last game, which is the most important to you, Notre Dame traveling to Kyle field, the 12th man. I know we've said a couple of places on here are tough places to play. This might be the, toughest place to play in terms of crowd size, in terms of enthusiasm. 
but this is not Jimbo Fisher's Texas A&M. And Texas A&M, in my opinion, is known for winning, but not winning anything of significance. They're like the Penn State of the SEC in a lot of ways. Notre Dame, if they want to be in the national spotlight, has got to win this game. This is a tough way to start the season, but I'll tell you what, I think Marcus Freeman is going to have the boys ready to go. And this is year three for him. And I know that year three for Notre Dame coaches traditionally has meant something. But how do you feel about this game? Well, obviously, you're going into one of the toughest environments to play in the country uh, this time of year in Texas. It, the, it's going to be hot and warm and all these things. But like, you know, my dad and I have talked about this stuff. And I say, if Notre Dame is what people think they could be, like those things don't matter, right? You know, playing in a tough environment. And Notre Dame gets everybody's best shot every time. You know, the, every, the fans always show out on the road when Notre Dame comes to town. So uh, I know Kyle Field is a unique place. I have all the respect in the world for that environment. I have all the respect in the world for Mike Elko. I think he's a hell of a football coach. You know, I think that we will probably see, you know, I don't think, I think a lot of people think that the cupboard was left bare at AM, that it's definitely not the case. They're very talented. But it, the what comes down, what this matchup comes down to, is there are very unique matchups that exist on the field with position groups. Uh, for example, Texas A&M has one of the best defensive fronts in the country. Notre Dame's offensive line. Are you ready for this? Brace yourself. Combined between the five starters, have six starts, six career starts. They are starting a true freshman at left tackle. Okay, so um, imagine this, Iceman. Uh, you're 18 years old. Uh, you just got recruited in Notre Dame. There was a guy that was supposed to be the starting left tackle that was sort of like the shoe in to be left tackle. The guy tears his ACL. He's going to be out for the season. Um, you still think, I mean, you know, there's some upperclassmen that maybe would get the nod of head, not ahead of you. You're about two weeks out from the opener, and all of a sudden, you're the starter against one of the best defensive ends in the country in front of 110,000 people at Kyle Field, 12th man, and you were just in high school six months ago. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, just like wrap your head around that. Um, and that's why I think sometimes we like we lose out or we forget how impressive it is that some of these guys do what they do under the circumstances. I mean, I would crap my pants if there was 110,000 people watching me do anything. Except for this. <laughs> right, yeah. Let alone, you know, having to go like essentially hand-to-hand -hand combat for two hours with another man. Um, and so... That'll be an interesting matchup uh, to see how the young talent of Notre Dame matches up with the experience and talent of the A&M defensive front. But there is something to be had to be taken from the Texas A&M secondary. They are not nearly as strong as the front is. And so can Notre Dame find a way to pick, you know, to pick apart the secondary? Is Riley Leonard going to have time? Um, I know people are probably concerned about a pass rush. I think that, you know, a good screen game and some good offensive play calling can slow a pass rush down to some degree. Uh, you know, we will see. I think Mike Denbrock certainly qualified uh, for the job. Um, I'm excited to see what the new look offense from Notre Dame looks like with what I will say. I'll say a, a real offensive coordinator. You know, Notre Dame, I, I, I expect it. You know, my dad, 35-17, that's a lot of points, man. I think the under over in this game is at like 40-something. Yeah. I think low. it's going to be a low-scoring game. It's just going to come down to like who can make fewer mistakes. I think both offenses are going to struggle a little bit, and not because they're bad, but just because both defenses are that good. Points are going to be hard to come by, and it's just like who can play more disciplined and take care of the football. Um, you know, so it, it's going to be a fun game to watch, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I do think it, it could, it's going to be a, a win that would kind of like vault either of these teams to a really successful season. Needless to say, there is a lot of college football to watch this weekend. These are the games that we have honed in on. And I just want to remind everybody that we are going to be posting our crunch time, as we call it. We haven't done this in a while where we do some rapid fire picking. So this is the slate of games that we're going to be looking at. And in the future, we will try to put these out every single week. And you can let us know who you want to or who you think is going to win in these games. All right, man. We went through all the games. We're heading up to the end here and we got just a little bit of business to cover. As always, Iceman stat of the week. I'm a statistician. I like to give out stats. Coach, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So we have talked about Florida State. We have talked about Deion Sanders. 
the most career interceptions in Florida State history. Number one, Terrell Buckley with 21. Number five, Monk Bonasorte with 15. Deion Sanders with 14. Do you know who he is tied with at 14? For interceptions at Florida State? Correct. No. Lee Corso. Wow. Isn't that great? Holy crap. Yes. Hopefully I have not That's been had by the internet there, but it was from That's a awesome. uh, it was from college game day and Lee Corso did that 1953 to 1956. That's crazy. He must have intercepted every pass because that's Basically. probably all they did. They threw 15 <laughs> times in a game. That's it. You're not wrong about that. I thought that was hilarious. I found that last week. I've had that in the hopper since we did a show last week, and I thought that you would love it. All right, man. Love it. One more thing to go. All right, sir. Coach's pick of the week. You are 3 and 0 as we discussed earlier as Delaware State covered against Hawaii this week. I think this is the first time you've ever been 3 and 0. However, the can, you know, the streak can roll on here. So, please, with all of these games that we have, bless us with another picketh of the week. <clears throat> hear ye, hear ye. You sound surprised, Iceman, uh that I'm off to this hot start. I, however, am not. Not in the slightest. Hopefully, those of you that have been following my picks cashed in last week and are on your way to a happy retirement. If not, we still have another opportunity ahead of you this weekend. I am doing something this week that I usually try not to do. I'm breaking one of my rules. I am following my heart this weekend. And it's leading me to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I want you to join me in chasing down this precious treasure. I'm ready. I am taking my Notre Dame Fighting Irish to win outright against Texas A&M. I think this is the team that can get Notre Dame back on the path to competing for national championships consistently. I believe in Marcus Freeman, that he is the one. All due respect to Mike Elko and the boys, but you're going to have to wait until your turn comes around because the Irish are coming to town, and I think that this is going to be the statement win that Notre Dame needs to Vault them to an extremely successful season. Finally, shut up the haters all around the country. They're like never going to happen. Notre Dame. Never going to happen. That's fine. That's fine. We just shut them up on the scoreboard. Give me the Irish to win outright in College Station over Texas A&M. The Fighting Irish and Touchdown Jesus over Mike Elko, the 12th man, and Texas A&M. Coach, so let it be written, so let it be done. All right, sir, we have reached the end of this football frenzy. And while I had a few slip-ups in the stat department, you had a slip-up in the stat department. It was pretty much par for the course here at Sports 101. That's right, man. This is what we do. This is how we do it. If you don't like it, you can move on and watch another mediocre podcast. <laughs> Plenty of them to go around. <laughs> Plenty of them to go around. Uh, no, we have a good time here, man. This is a lot of fun. And I am, dude, I'm so pumped for this weekend. I cannot Me too. like oh I, I cannot overstate it. Just tomorrow night we get Colorado and North Dakota State, which is just like must watch TV in my opinion. Uh, there's a few games Friday, none of them are like great, but there's still meaningful college football on. And then Saturday, man, like we've just got a full slate of great matchups, and I just inject it into my veins. Here for it, can't wait. Me too. Before we get out of here in this episode, Coach, if you'll allow me a minute to give a special message to the audience. So this week, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, is the third anniversary of my mother's passing. And I just want to say before we get out of this episode, while this is a fun time of year, we had a ton of fun in this episode. I just want to remind everybody, when you have that chance to hug a loved one, call, text, whatever it is, take that moment because as we get older and older, that time gets more and more fleeting. Coach, this is a great episode. I had such a good time. This is a great, it, this set the tone for the rest of the year, and we're going to have a ton of fun with Football Frenzy. So if you're new to this game, you can follow us on social media. You can find us wherever you find your podcast, specifically if you are listening, Apple, Spotify, give us a few stars there. Maybe give us a review. It'll make us feel good. And other than that, we will see you next week. Coach, this is Football Frenzy.
The opinions and viewpoints expressed on INC Sports are those of Matt Freights, Brad Powell, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty S Media Network. INC Sports is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and Brad Powell and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.